Welcome to the place where we learn about and learn from the leaders in our field who are powering human creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Arts Engines. <laughs> Thanks again for joining me here on Arts Engines. Today's guest is Libby Larson, who is an extraordinarily com acclaimed composer. Libby, welcome to the show. Thanks, Aaron. It's a pleasure to be here. So I am so excited to talk to you. Obviously, you know, most of our audience knows kind of who you are, but so I'd really love to try and be able to kind of delve into, you know, kind of not just the, the breadth of, of your work and kind of yeah. give our audience a, a glimpse into your own inspirations, um, but also this sense of where you feel kind of, you know, the canon is, and maybe that's really the best place to start, um, kind of how do you view the classical music canon and, and do you kind of see or view uh, yourself playing a role in, in reframing it? Well, we're, we're talking about a momentous topic here, uh, uh, but um, I'll just um, uh, begin by saying that um, uh, when I decided I would study music at the University of Minnesota in the early 1970s, you know, um, I, I, uh, I really met this subject of the canon uh, uh, right away. Uh, I entered the university uh, as a freshman, thinking that I would become an opera singer, uh, <laughs> but um, 17 years old, you know, or a stockbroker, one or the other. Uh, but um, uh, uh, I, uh, when, when I um, entered there, um, I had an interesting experience uh, auditioning for a voice teacher, uh, uh, which we all do when we enter a university system. You you audition uh, as a uh, to take a performance art, uh, and so I prepared my piece uh, and went before the the jury of uh, voice teachers, uh, and um, and I opened my mouth and I began to sing. Sing. I began to sing, uh, and I noticed the noticed right away the looks on their faces. Uh, uh, which were, which were a mix of uh, uh, of disdain, you know, of incredulity, you know, of sympathy, of compassion, uh, and um, the reason I, I bring that up right away is that the 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 piece that I had prepared to audition to become a, a, a student, a vocal student, was um, a popular tune at the time uh, called "Georgie Girl." Uh, uh, and um, and I sang it very well, thank you very much. <laughs> but um, that was my, uh, uh, I think, the end of innocence uh, uh, for for me as a passionate musician uh, in the American musical culture of the uh, of the late nineteen sixties. Mm -hmm. uh, because I love I love all kinds I, I I just love music. Uh, and and never thought about canons or hierarchies or or you know at all. But of course, uh, 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 I I came face to face with uh, the, the 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 way I wanted to study music, uh, which is which was uh, a, a rigorous academic training, you know, and the music that I that really moves my soul. Most of it, uh, most of it is not part of the what we call the canon of classical music uh and 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 still isn't so so my um my um i i've always been walking the walk of uh of i guess what now is known as a disruptor you know in that in that from from that first georgie girl experience to us talking today um it it's been in my heart that if, if our classical music canon um, cannot take in the voices of who we are as living, creative, passionate, musical people and reflect ourselves from through the way it makes music, that there is something quite wrong and that needs to, to change. So, 
uh, so that's it for me, you know, and, and I, and I've worked in many, many, you know, all different ways, writing symphonies, being on boards of directors, really, in really, uh, I wanted to say infiltrating, but it's true, you know, infiltrating the, the just the system of purveying, uh, uh, um, music through acoustic classical instruments uh, to try to understand why, you know, why a composer such as myself or you or, you know, Anthony Davis, you know, why aren't we front and center, you know, on the, you know, uh, in the, in the symphonic literature of our, of our culture. Right. And, you know, it's so amazing. And you've got this wonderful breadth of, you know, of, of body of work, I think over 500 works at least. Yeah. Before, and, um, and, um, and a history celebrated last year by the Schubert Club, our co <laughs> our co-curator for this episode, which we're so excited about. Um, and, and I'm curious from that perspective of not just your, your own body of work, but, uh, but organizations that you've helped to, to co-found and create that ultimately, of course, has now become American Composers Forum and, and, and others. How do you think we're doing? Where, how do you feel about where things are at now? Especially a lot of people feel like there's been some shifts over the past couple of years, given all the world events. I'm curious, right. what, what, how do you feel where we are at now? Are you optimistic? How do you feel? It's a really, a really good question. Um, I will um, answer that by um, telling you about um, an, uh, an ad for the Minnesota Orchestra that was, um, well, not an ad, on public radio this morning for a concert uh, that's coming up. And um, and the concert is uh, uh, is highlighting the music of, of underrepresented composers. No, is that progress? Um, I, I would have to say no. <laughs> you know, that it's the same old, same old from, you know, from my, you know, just, and I, and I say that with no malice. I say that through a thorough understanding of how the programming system for uh, classical music developed the canon, you know, and and how it, how um, wh where where we need to change the the center of uh, you know of that approach, so that a marginalized concert, which gives us a sampling of underrepresented composers, which is just about everybody, <laughs> you know, uh, 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 can move from the margin to the center. So that we we are presenting uh, uh, a, a, a concert, a concert of Wagner or of Mozart, you know, in a season of 52 concerts, rather than one concert of underrepresented composers, you, you know, in a season of 52 concerts uh does that make sense to you exactly right and and of course and and it's interesting right because uh, especially, you know, some of the work that I, I've done, you know, with, with Sphinx relating to uh, yes. also, of course, underrepresented composers. And and then there, you know, people would have, oh, you know, we'll do this concert for Black History Month or for whatever. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. okay, I don't want you to end that, but wouldn't it be great to play it throughout the year? So, it's, right. so I definitely get that that shift. And is there is there a sense that you've that that you have of are there things we could do? You know, our audience is, is filled with people who are leaders and presenters and orchestras and all of that. Is there is there anything that we could do or do you think there's some barrier? Do you, do you feel, you know, a lot of times people will feel, especially at orchestras, well, you know, we'd love to have all of our programming be, you know, this broad, diverse representation of composers, but our audiences, they think our audiences, you know, only will come for Mozart and et cetera. And, and, all of right. kind of our typical historical. Do you have any suggestions or thoughts either about the barriers that exist or that those leaders in our audience who are watching this right now, you would say, well, do this and that will help make this change. I I, I do have, have many suggestions, uh, but I, and I think it must begin with those who would be leaders, you know, in this field, um, uh, educating themselves uh, as to where the canon comes from and the notion, you, you know, and, and the idea that 
classical mu musical audiences must already be familiar you know, with the work in order to come to the hall. No, that, that's a mythology, that's a Gordian knot uh, that, that was developed uh, at the turn of the, of, the, of the last century, between about 1880 and about 1920. This, this Gordian knot of the canon uh, uh, was uh, was completely constructed uh, long before the the industry of classical music uh, became what it is today, um, uh, and and so the canon itself, right, which we could talk for hours about where that comes from. I did all of my research at the Library of Congress, at the John Kluge Center, was in search of the canon to try to understand where you know. <laughs> Why is it only Copeland and Bernstein, and why are they not considered serious? You know, you know, uh, you know I mean, <laughs> um, I, I was really trying to understand the canon uh, um, uh, uh, and its relevance to the, the soul of who we are, you know, as, as an American, very young you know, country that's completely fluid. I was trying to understand it. The um, uh, the, um, the the canon that that we we've, we've built um, those of us who are interested in symphonic repertoire, which also, by the way, includes all of music education. You know our entire training system. You, you know the idea of of a, of a hierarchy of what is good and you know what is lesser, what is good. Um, there, there's a very clear source of how this all started. Uh, 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 it's very clear. Uh, 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 and um, those of us who would lead, I think, you know, you lead, you lead from knowledge of what it is you're leading away from or to or around, you know. And I, I do believe that, uh, in fact, I know it, um, that uh, those of us who would lead don't know this history. We don't know it. Uh, it, it, it's all there. It's all there at, you know, at, and I spent my time at the Library of Congress pulling it all together. You know, it's really the combination of, of, uh, of development of transportation, development of communication systems, uh, 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 and the idea of standardized time and a standardized approach in America. All came together during that one little period of time. Um, and that's, that um, spawned uh, the system that we are that we are now uh, that now feels in desperate need of a rejuvenation. You know, we can't rejuvenate it unless we know what it is. You know, so uh, my solution would be: let me talk to you, you know, and, and tell you everything I know. You know, um, and so that we we can get it, we can get the real foundation of what it is we need to change. You know, otherwise. Um, we will continue, I think, uh, either uh, the orchestral world, the classical musical world will continue to do what it's doing, which is it's not in, it's not in good health, you know, uh, and it's slowly, slowly, slowly not in good health. You know? <laughs> um, uh, and, and we will continue to try to put band-aids on it. One, that's one thing we'll do. Another thing we'll do is we will have these times of upheaval in the culture, you know, uh, where the symphony orchestra says, ooh, we're, we're part of this. We need to respond. But we don't need to respond. We need to change at the center. You know, uh, we, uh, re responding is part of, of changing at the center, but we really need to change at the center. That doesn't mean abandoning the the art form at, at all um but if we don't know what it is that that we've been building and perpetrating you know for the this past breathless 120 years you, you know then um then how then how can we lead no absolutely absolutely well it's just it is fascinating everything that you're sharing and and i encourage anyone and everyone in our audience to think about and to reach out uh to libya because there are so many collaborations that that you have had and currently do that are having such an impact and unfortunately we are just about out of time but i always like to ask of all of my guests yes. um, you know in this work that you do in this extraordinary constant creation that you bring uh kind of into existence there's got to be tough days uh mm -hmm. days where you feel frustrated and i'm curious where do you turn 
for inspiration, for strength when times are tough for you? Hmm. <laughs> um, I, uh, well, personally, I, I, I turn to nature. I go outdoors, <laughs> you know, and, um, which I've done instinctually. You know, I, I, I go outdoors and I walk or, uh, or sit on a dock. I love to sit on docks and watch the infinity of water, <laughs> what it does. Uh, uh, I, I try to take my frustration, which is usually, you know, all our frustrations, they're bound in all kinds of things, which really turn out to be not so important, you know, <laughs> uh, 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 um, what I what I try to do is is uh, is take the advice of a very wise uh, a painter who uh, um, uh, uh, Kathleen O'Loughlin is her name. And when I was young in my early thirties, and that that's young, you know, for me, uh, 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 she said she said just always make sure that you live near something which is much larger than you. And and she she meant mountain sky you, you know nature you know and um and and I I I guess I when I'm frustrated I turn to her voice in my head saying you know what's larger than you right now and you know and it turns out almost everything. <laughs> well, that is incredible, Libby Larson. You truly are one of the arts engines who is powering human creativity in our world. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks, Aaron. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. And thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you.